Okay, so first of all, thank you very much, uh, Luciana and Carolina for the organization of this great uh, seminar and also um, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share with you my research um, about Islamabad um, that I did during my PhD dissertation about 15 years ago. Um, Islamabad as the new capital of Pakistan was designed uh, during 1959 to 1963 by the Greek architect urbanist uh, Konstantinos Doxiadis as a city of the future. In today's presentation, uh, maybe first I should uh, clarify um, that I will focus on one particular theme, uh, and that is to reinterpret uh, the legacy, uh, the environmental legacy as nature settlement or nature city dialectics that are embedded in the making of this plan for Islamabad. Um, to further clarify a little bit what I mean by nature city dialectics is that such dialectics on the one hand shows an attempt to transcend previous notions of nature in the city and functioning zoning. And it aims at simultaneous development of landscape, townscape and amelioration of climatic conditions to ensure environmental quality that was seen by Doxiadis as a measure of success for uh, the city of the future. On the other hand, such dialectics um, allows transcending a binary opposition of nature city as viewing nature at multiple scale levels, begins to inform its multiple relations with the city that provides a new framework for rediscovering mid-century environmentalism. So the way I'm going to present this is to first share with you uh, such dialectics in practice, uh, looking at Betsiadis' notion of uh, landscape, how nature is integrated in the plan for Islamabad, and the rereading of that integration. I'll briefly touch upon what um, Doxiadis develops that as a theory into acoustics, diagrammatic reasoning. And lastly, uh, if time still allowed, I'll try to kind of share some uh, ideas about the relevance of such idea of urbanism today as urban ecosystems um, and the new disciplinary realignments. So without any further ado, what I did today is that to share with you first at a very simple level, this idea of the nature settlement dialectics by showing you this picture, which is uh, um, part of the Punjab University uh, campus that was also designed by Boxiadis in parallel with the project of Islamabad. Um, so it is from the same time period and what I want to show with you is this relationship between the built or let's say the architecture and the open, the void, the landscape. And what I want to um, emphasize here to take this notion with you that neither is overpowering the other. Neither the landscape is overpowering the architecture nor architecture is overpowering the landscape. Rather, there's a kind of a symbiotic uh, integrative uh, as an attempt to synthesis is presented. And this, uh, the reason I chose this because when we scale up this relation to the metropolitan scale, it becomes more complex as multiple relations begins to unfold. And this is the master plan for Islamabad. As you can see, the original master plan also says on the top left that this is a master plan for the metropolitan area, which covers over 1,000 uh, square kilometers. And what you can see over here is that um, a large 
green open space, which is National Park and the hills, the ecological corridor and the city. So as if city and nature are placed next to each other side by side, and then the, the, the dialectics that I will elaborate uh, will, uh, will, will, will show you the different types of relations at different scales that we can discern. Uh, the white triangle, uh, sorry, the rectangle that is on this master plan is showing the part of the master plan which is on the next slide as a satellite image um, to show you the, the, the realization of, of, uh, of the plan. And this, set, this satellite image is rather dated, it is 2003, and by now I would add, let's say, a few more um, sectors that uh, are developed since then. And also to show you a kind of a perspective view of the, of the context of the landscape of the nature within which uh, this um, uh, metropolis as the new capital of Pakistan was uh, developed. So now let's look at the making of the plan. And there I try to structure this presentation with uh, three, uh, let's say, components. First, describing the uh, notion of landscape of the planner and then so here on this image, what you see is in 1959, the Federal Capital Commission um, earmarked this larger uh, region for the capital site. So the dark black line, which covers uh, something like 10,000 square kilometers area. And then within that, the vertical hatched uh, lines. I don't know if you can see the, my mouse, the cursor that is moving uh, on, on the boundary. Can you see the cursor on your screens? Yes, we can. Okay, we so you. that was the area that was earmarked for the new capital. And what you can also see that there was an existing city called Rawalpindi also located nearby. And this is a satellite image of, uh, or aerial image at that time, satellites didn't exist of the Rawalpindi uh, city. Um, over, uh, during my PhD dissertation about 15 years ago, I also looked into the landscape uh, studies that Oxiad has made uh, and based on the analysis of that, what I found there was that there was this notion of environmental quality that Oxiad has equated with the success of the city. So if the city is to be successful, it has to have a good environmental quality. And this environmental quality, uh, according to him, the strategy that he proposed in, in, in his plan was a simultaneous and continuous development of three elements, the landscape, the townscape, and the amelioration of climatic conditions. Uh, also paying partial attention to the local tradition and uh, the vernacular, which also, uh, of course, poses the question environmental quality for whom? Because obviously in the 60s, there is this discussion of uh, the abstract human subject. And today, of course, this notion of environmental justice, uh, environmental quality for whom? Uh, is, is a very important aspect uh, uh, that I will not develop in today's presentation, but I will deconstruct this notion of environmental quality achieved through these uh, strategies. So this is a reading of the landscape that Boxiadis makes. What you see on this drawing is in the north, the hills, um, and the series of uh, small uh, riverines and the existing city of Rawalpindi and a patchwork of small rural settlements dotting the landscape of the entire capital site. And what he traces out of this is these natural river systems, but also the areas in between the river valleys, the so-called smaller plateaus or flatter areas, uh, indicating a kind of an approach 
to, to structure a kind of a micro ecological structure of, of the area. This is a picture uh, of that time um, showing the majestic backdrop of the Margala Hills, uh, which are the foothills which connect to uh, all the way towards the Himalayas. Uh, and so from the plateau, the, 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 the elevation is almost 1,200 to 1,500 feet, so a very majestic backdrop and, and the agricultural landscape and rural settlements in this area. Uh, in this image, you can also see uh, besides the riverines, but also uh, at the foreground uh, where my mouse cursor is, the settlement pattern, a very compact uh, rural uh, settlements that were all over uh, this landscape. So going into the making of the plan and how he reads this uh, topographical microbiological structure, uh, developing models, physical models, but also hydrological analysis and others, and distinguishing of this uh, lakes area, the lower part, the existing city, and an upper part near the foothills. And within this uh, structure, there are, besides the Margala Hills to the north, which are the bigger hills, there are also three further ridges to the right where my mouse is, which also forms three uh, smaller river valleys uh, that actually defines uh, the, uh, the ecological structure of the landscape. But of course, um, this uh, mapping of ecological structure of the ravines as, as the deepest lines of the landscape are more from a settlement bias and not for the preservation of landscape, but more the economic logic of placing infrastructures at the deepest lines of landscape for gravity flow, for all kinds of utilities and transportation needs. And in between, identifying these planes for settlement. So the reading of the landscape is not really having a, a nature idea, but more as a way of structuring, reinterpreting the landscape of uh, appropriating it for a settlement structure. So what we see is the derivation of the main principal axis of the metropolitan area, what you see from northeast to southwest. So those deepest lines of the landscape along the rivers deriving one direction of the axis. And the other direction of the axis is this historic Grand Trunk Road, which connects all the South Asian capitals from Calcutta all the way to Kabul. And based on that, uh, this main structure of two principal axes was derived. But at the same time, what you can also see here is this idea of the size of the settlement, the size of the city, the size that will grow in time. Uh, the growth and expansion, of course, are primary concerns in this context of the 60s and how to develop a kind of an urban form or an urban structure that allows or uh, is capable of that gradual growth and expansion. So the small box is to uh, indicating size within five years and then 10 years and 20 years and so on and so forth. And there is this famous concept of Dinopolis, uh, the dynamically growing city, which has been elaborated in my other uh, papers. Uh, I will not focus on that today. But what you see is that also the large uh, uh, area, which is more ecologically sensitive with a lot of river valleys and all of that is appropriated as a kind of a national park with um, rural areas preserved, but also appropriation of agro uh, forestry uh, villages uh, for agriculture production, dairies, and, and so on and so forth. What is also interesting is that over this formulation, he proposes a grid which is two kilometers by two kilometers. Obviously, as a designer, you have to measure and you have to provide that measure. And what is interesting is that the idea of uh, what we saw yesterday uh, in Vikram Madhya's presentation, for instance, in Chandigarh, we see uh, this size of this grid is 800 meters by 1200 meters, which is approximately one square kilometer. And we know there is a good history of the neighborhood unit uh, from Clarence Stein and Perry, 
uh, the five minutes and 10 minutes walking distances. But here, what is interesting in this plan is this idea of two by two kilometers, the four square kilometer was derived based on an investigation into pre-industrial historical settlements. So over a few hundred pre-industrial settlements uh, or cities across the world were mapped and an average diameter was derived about 2000 meters across. And as for example, you can see uh, in, in Dr. Siavis's um, uh, rendering of, of this concept in the master plan of Islamabad, that in the first four sectors, he tries to put the classical Athens, uh, the old London, uh, Paris, uh, and the Renaissance, Florence, as a scale where human scale can be preserved. So his interpretation of the modern metropolis is the multiplication of the historic city, the historic city which can preserve the human scale or the living environment, and the metropolitan scale, which is more with the mythological structures and other areas. For um, locating political power and landscape relationship, what I would like to highlight here is this series of little topographical mounds uh, or little hillocks that he maps on this area, makes models of that. And so this very kind of a Greek notion of locating Acropolis on the highest hilltop. Uh, so locating um, or, um, the, the institutions of state or political power for these kind of hillocks uh, at, at a kind of high altitude. So this area is further analyzed. And what is interesting here is that if you see that all the monumental structures, so where my mouse is located here at this focus is the parliament, the capital complex, or let's say the representation of the state. But also if you see the end of the axis here, the grand mosque located and other significant symbolic uh, uh, elements and structures that are located. So. They are not located inside the city, but at the edge of the city and the landscape. And this is a kind of very uh, interesting urban design device that I later on investigated that it was a typical urban design device in most of the 17th century European capital cities, for instance, in Versailles, but also in Jaipur, and in, 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 even in the plan of Chandigarh, you can find and the interpretation of this urban design tool is to locate the state or political power as uh, the arbiter or the regulator of the relationship between the citizens or the society and nature, nature as resources, nature as religion, nature as belief system, nature as culture, but also the relationship with city. So locating power structures to regulate these relationships is a fairly common urban design device uh, steeped into uh, history. So we further uh, go uh, into uh, the structuring of this area, the chief executive in relationship with the three powers of the state. So you see uh, at the middle of the axis uh, is the legislature and the judiciary and the executive are on the two sides, but of course, in the Pakistani context, the legislator went on a side and the executive became the center uh, of, of the power structure, what we call the establishment. And of course here also the idea that even the capital complex is not something fixed in size, but the capital complex and all the state institutions requires growth and expansion and for those axes were determined and the comparison of Islamabad capital complex with the Washington Mall, uh, the main, uh, let's say, capital area of the um, United States, or in Paris from uh, La Louvre to Arc de Triomphe, the main monumental part. So to give a scale of the capital complex of, of Islamabad. What is also interesting is that the has developed this very interesting urban design scheme with the main national square, the parliament and the uh, Supreme Court building and the secretariat and ministries, but it was an urban design scheme. And he uh, proposed a competition. And as a result of that, we have uh, Kenzo Tange designing the Supreme Court, the American architect at the Beatle Stone doing the parliament, the Italian architect Gio Ponti and Rosselli uh, associates doing the secretariat building. So it really developed as a kind of an urban design uh, scheme. Now, 
let's go to the rereading of this plan and locating this, um, uh, the new federal capital uh, region, uh, which is located on this plateau, we call that Portoir Plateau, which uh, is a kind of a first transition between the greater Himalayas and the plains of Punjab below and the Indus River system. And of course, I, do, I don't have much time to develop the 1960s uh, developmentalism assisted by World Bank and this water treaty and uh, all those green revolution that they wanted to develop by damming the rivers, creating energy and food production and industrial settlements and so on. But it was part of this larger vision of developmentalism, the high modernism, so the construction of large dams, uh, Kerbela to the north of the federal capital area, which is one of the largest earth-filled dam in the world on Indus River, but also the other dam to kind of provide a larger infrastructure, water, energy, and food for, for the capital region. But if we zoom in as part of the, uh, of the initial uh, first four sectors, the two by two kilometers, the first four sectors, to look at this relationship a bit more in detail, what we find here is that two kinds of grids. The one grid that I explained, the purple line, which is the 2000 meters by 2000 meters, which we would call a formal grid or a planning grid. And what we see also the ecological grid that I uh, developed the term for it back in my PhD dissertation. And just like the formal grid, the ecological grid, which is draining the mountains into forming the rivers down uh, under, are also given a right of way sometimes as wide as 200 to 300 meters for all kinds of flora and fauna and wildlife to kind of continue throughout. But the formal grid is also given uh, a kind of a structure within which the settlement pattern is defined. The settlement spaces are the articulation of the open space design and the urban form here, what you see is defined by the structuring of the landscape. Uh, within which different typologies are inserted. Uh, some linear elements, so the institutional elements and the economic structure, what you would call the CBD or the central business district, which is located here, but also it is connected to the smaller city. So this idea of a historic city, each sector uh, going from 30,000 and up to 100,000 population, different densities that are possible and linking this idea of, um, of the linear structure of the CBD with the Marvela Hills as a kind of a linear structure interlock, interlocking the landscape into the CBD and around each sector of the green belt mimicking the historic city that was surrounded by a kind of a wall and landscape around to buffer the residential environment from. Uh, and this is the, the residential housing, the urban form kind of evaporates the structuring element is the landscape here, and these landscape elements, the ravines, uh, were carefully sort of studied for the watershed area and their amelioration, their banks, and a lot of chuck dams, and all of that was developed. And what you see, all these diagonal elements as realized in uh, the landscape uh, of Islam today. But zooming out at the metropolitan scale, we also see the larger ecological structure along the main axis, almost 2000 meters wide, uh, northeast to southwest, uh, but also uh, along the river at the bottom, kind of a green buffer for uh, the dust laden uh, hot winds from the south to dampen and cool off before entering into the metropolitan area. And that is uh, the bread basket of the metropolitan area with a lot of ecological structure, but also agriculture and daily production, linear structures for industrial and trade activities and all those structures. And there's also a lot uh, that was developed for ameliorating the microclimatic conditions from the scale of the metropolitan area to down to the residential scale and so on. So what we see is this um, urban ecosystem as a kind of a metropolitan framework, urban ecosystem where nature and urban ecosystems as well, like the central business district as an economic structure. So what we see is these elements of National Park, the Margala Ecological Corridor in the north, the central business district of Islamabad, the interurban green, and the existing city of Rawalpindi to also grow in a particular direction and the Swan green. 
as a way of metropolitan integration of urban, industrial, agricultural, and natural realms or landscape to provide what we would interpret today as ecosystem services like local food provision, local watershed maintenance, clean water supply, air quality, biodiversity, uh, local climate amelioration, and so on and so forth. Of course, this development is uh, also reflected in theory, as you, some of you probably would know, Doxiad has also developed a science for logistics, the science of human settlements. In 1968, this canonical book that came out, but what I would like you to also see that in one of his last book in 1976, he also proposed uh, the book called Ecology and Logistics, the Global Spatial Planning for Global Ecological Balance, whereby dividing the whole global terrestrial space into some kind of a technocratic vision that he believed would be implemented to ensure this coexistence of settlement and uh, nature structure. Uh, but also this diagrammatic reasoning that he develops as kind of a theory, which is not theory, but theory of practice, like infiltration of nature into human settlements, much better than a large park. And we see how this is uh, some observation from the plan of Islam and elsewhere that he uh, did this planning and more kind of a diagrammatic representation of the relationship between man, nature and machines. But this um, process continues. He developed these kind of canonical references like nature provides the foundation upon which the settlements are created and the framework within which they function to uh, all kinds of statements that became uh, like, we have to bring nature into the city of man and not keep it out to be visited during long weekends and so on and so forth. And his project for the Great Lake Megalopolis that I don't have the time here to develop, but you can clearly see the reasoning of uh, the importance of water, energy, mobility, and the value of landscape to structure urbanization in a, a kind of a dialectic with uh, natural landscape elements, but also spatializing this concept of global ecological balance as a um, basically, um, the, 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 the world city that we imagine as the urbanization of unchecked would reach to this kind of a structure of 20 billion inhabitants by 2100. And what he highlighted was that while this happens, what will happen to uh, what he called the human kipos, which is the global garden. So all the nature areas and what he emphasized there was for this global ecological balance, whereby uh, the balance of the global ecosystem on one hand and human settlement and other intervention by mankind on the other, resulting in a situation suitable for the continuation of human life and of nature and global ecological balance as an ultimate goal that is dependent on achievement and maintenance of a complex series of balances at lower scales. What we see, what happened to the Ecumeno Kipos, we have this national parks and protected areas movement all over the world, um, but also what we see the new disciplinary alignments, this relationship of nature and settlement reconfigured into new urbanism to principles of green urbanism and landscape urbanism and ecological urbanism and so on. And here, uh, what you would see is that it's just a coincidence that on the left top image, uh, one would see that this is a sector of Islamabad with this diagonal green and the square sector, but actually, uh, it's anybody's guess. It is uh, Norman Foster's uh, plan for Masdar City, the first carbon neutral city built in UAE. Uh, so to conclude, I think some key takeaways that uh, I would like to debate and discuss later that of course, this kind of top down technocratic vision of, of planning is is uh, is not something that has been appreciated a lot, and we need to be aware of a political and a social theorization of this idea of global ecological balance, urban ecosystems as complex adaptive systems at multiple scales, and the value of interdisciplinarity. But also, what we learn is that the spatial dimension of socioeconomic development is important to be considered. And lastly, expanding the body of design knowledge, what we uh, learn from the overview of Doxiadis is 
the role of historic city, unlike the mainstream modernists for whom historic city was not a model or an anti-model, but here we see that historic city landscape and vernacular are part of design knowledge, uh, strategic simplification of complex systems as a design strategy, multiscalarity flows and overlapping, nature and the city integration and integrative synthesis. So I would end my presentation here. I'm sorry that I've taken almost 30 minutes um, and I would be happy to uh, be part of listening to the other colleagues and then take part in the panel discussion later on. And if there are any questions right now, um, please feel free.